Hello, it's uh, lecture seven. Uh, today we are going to do something different. It's going to be unsupervised learning. So in the case where we don't have labeled data, uh, we'll still be able to do something interesting. So we'll cover uh, principal component analysis. It's a dimensionality reduction technique. And then we'll discuss uh, clustering. So it's a very, very broad topic, uh, unsupervised learning. Uh, and so we can uh, divide it into several s popular subtasks. One moment. Yeah, so very, very broad area, unsupervised learning. <coughs> so what's the difference with supervised learning? Uh, in a nutshell, previously we had this uh, instance feature matrix X and a vector Y targets. And uh, the difference is simply that we now we don't have this Y. We've got only instances and their features. Can we still do something useful? Yep, sure, we can. Uh, we already discussed how uh, getting these labels can be really uh, different, really complicated. So it can be just uh, Pricely, yep, it can require some money, or even methodo uh, methodo uh, sorry. Uh, methodology even uh, will not allow us to get many nice labels. By the way, uh, I've got this problem in the current project, so uh, we don't have an, a very nice source of reliable labels, so they are given by assessors, by some people, and uh, we don't have pr very much of them, uh, uh, just man many labels, and we don't uh, really trust in them. So getting labels can be both time consuming or uh, it can require some money or even from a methodological side, uh, it can be challenging. And so just in case where we, we've got some uh, instances, again, L instances with uh, D features, uh, what can we do in such case? So first, uh, a broad, broad topic is clustering. We'll cover it today a bit. So it's uh, simply, it's, uh, even the term is intuitive. It's uh, grouping objects in some uh, similar subgroups. Uh, and so thus we can find some structure in our data. Uh, then a broad topic is, is also dimensionality reduction. <coughs> we can do it either th for uh, speed. So suppose you've got lots and lots of features. Actually, you can uh, decrease your dimensions to make your uh, supervised learning algorithms more efficient. Uh, but we can do it on our own just for the sake of, let's say, visualization. So if you think about it, visualization is also a dimensionality reduction. So we need to somehow find a nice mapping from these D dimensions onto uh, space, either 2D subspace or 3D subspace, but still it's a dimensionality reduction. Uh, and we don't have labels here, so nobody tells us whether visualization is good or not. So we just need to find this mapping from D dimensions to two or rarely three dimensions. And also here we'll cover in detail uh, one popular technique, uh, PCA, principal component analysis. And we already discussed uh, TSNE, so it's a very popular technique. It, it's also about dimensionality reduction, and mostly it's for uh, visualization. So here goes uh, TSNE, this uh, fancy algorithm that we discussed uh, while visualizing data. Uh, though there are some more recent ones, like UMAP. Uh, so lots of research is done here in, uh, for visualization. And more broadly, it's uh, it's called, uh, uh, one moment, uh, so how is it called? It, it, it's called uh, manifold learning. So manifold learning is much, much broader topic. It's finding ni nice projections from higher dimensional space onto lower dimensional space. So more scientifically, it's called uh, manifold learning. Okay, then there are some 
other groups of tasks. Uh, if you think about it, estimating uh, density of your probability distribution is also an unsupervised learning task. So it's uh, density estimation. Uh, even as simple as a histogram and uh, smoothing it as you do it in, in pandas. So if you've got some distribution and, and you would like to, to build such a nice, nice curve, uh, like this one. Again, we've got only data. In this case, it's just one dimensional. And we somehow need to build a nice uh, curve smoothing this distribution. Uh, so a very popular technique here is uh, kernel density estimation. And if you think about it, it's an unsupervised learning task. So again, we don't have a signal whether we do it really nice or, or not. Uh, we just uh, need to somehow build this, uh, this smooth uh, curve. <coughs> then some, several other subtasks, like uh, again, missing data, filling, filling this missing data. This all can be c categorized as unsupervised learning tasks. Uh, but the most popular ones are clustering and dimensionality reduction. So we're go going to cover these topics today. <coughs> Just a very, very brief intro. Of course, unsupervised learning is a very, very broad task. And uh, our course is mainly focused on supervised learning. Maybe it's not too fair towards unsupervised learning because it also incor incorporates uh, much more complicated topics like uh, uh, neural nets autoencoders also uh, are used to find some structure in our data. It's also unsupervised learning. So many, many uh, nice topics here and only uh, one lecture. Yeah, sorry for that. So for an introduction, we'll cover principal component analysis and clustering. Can you mention uh, also the ambition topic, uh, specifically the Yeah, so the question was uh, whether neural, neural networks are some uh, another topic that we don't cover here. Yeah, the, the answer is, uh, yeah, this is a basic course in machine learning. So a, a neural network course will require some more 10 or 12 weeks. Uh, so yeah, we are not diving into it right now. <coughs> okay, so let's start with the main idea of principal component analysis. Uh, I would say to fully understand uh, it, uh, you would better dive into linear algebra and it's a bit challenging. Uh, but as always, I'll just deliver some very basic intuition about it. Uh, so suppose we've got some two features in our data set that correlate really heavily, very much. <coughs> uh, so this can be occasional, like just some correlation on our data set. And we know some very nice examples of, uh, of mysterious correlations. Uh, different sites are devoted just for finding mysterious correlations in data. So your two, two of your features, this would be x1 and x2, Two of your features in your data set can correlate just by chance. Even up to a really high correlation, 90% uh, or more. The question is, if these features correlate so, so much, do we need both of them? Is it really necessary to keep both of these features? The idea is that, we in that instead of these two features, we can introduce maybe another one, uh, like, like this one some feature Z, and uh, we'll just drop the initial two features and we'll keep only one feature Z. And so that's why we'll uh, reduce our dimension dimensionality in our data set from two features to only one. And so to describe again our uh, instance and feature matrix, we've got the matrix big X and its dimensions uh, are L uh, L points here and uh, two dimensions. And we're g going to, to convert it somehow uh, to a matrix Z. And uh, so it, it, it'll be actually a vector now. It'll be L points and only one dimension. <coughs> so how can we do it? The idea of principal component analysis is uh, to find these uh, dimensions uh, to preserve the most uh, information in our initial data set. So if we reduce dimensions, anyway, it will be a lossy uh, transformation. And uh, let's figure out what, what we lose here. So suppose uh, we picked a very nice 
so intuitively we understand that maybe it's a nice dimension Z. Uh, so if we project all the points here, so let's say it's one of the points in our initial data set, and with this procedure we'll project it on this uh, uh, direction Z. So initially we had uh, for this point, let's say it's point A, and for it we had uh, some X1, A, and X2, again A. Instead of this, we introduced uh, only one uh, measurement, Z, for this, for this A. And so what we lose here, we'll, uh, so we'll, project, we'll do a projection on this uh, Z. Uh, so in some sense, we, uh, we keep the information along this uh, direction Z. So if another point somewhere here is different, then we, we see that its projection will also differ. But at the same time, we'll, we'll, we'll lose this information about this distance to, to the new direction Z. So if by chance we've got some point on the opposite side, I would say A prime, it can be projected on, onto the very same point ZA. So you see, we're, we're going to make a, a lossy transformation, uh, keeping only information in this direction where Z points. <coughs> so here we, we keep information, and in orthogonal uh, direction, we, we lose information. And the idea is to choose a direction in a way that we keep the most information and lose uh, uh, the, the least information. Uh, so again, if we just pick a random direction li like this one, maybe you see that it's not really nice because if we project onto this direction, it's uh, not going to work really nice. So all, almost all points will be grouped in the very same region. And uh, uh, at the same time, these distan distances to this uh, blue direction will be very high. So we'll, in this case, we'll lose much information. So how do we pick uh, a nice one? So there are several uh, alternative formulations of this problem. Uh, so again, this uh, cloud of points. And we need to find uh, some direction. Uh, so it's easier actually to, to make it uh, centered. So we'll, we'll center our data uh, so that origin stays in the, in the middle of our data cloud. Okay, almost in the middle. So our parameter uh, here will be this direction. So how can we formalize it? Uh, so it's just a vector point, pointing somewhere. So it has two components, right? Alpha 1 and alpha 2. This will be vector u. And we are going to find an, a nice one so that uh, we keep uh, most information and lose the least information. So u can be anything, so we'll, we'll tune this alpha 1 and alpha 2. Uh, and the, these actually define this vector u. And uh, it's going to, to point somewhere, and we project data on, onto this uh, direction, right? As we did it for, for that z-axis. <coughs> okay, so if we project it onto th this uh, direction, we'll have some variance in our data with regards to this direction. Yep, so if we project all the points here, we can measure variance of all these uh, projections, so of all these measurements uh, on this direction u, right? So it's uh, maximizing this variance as projected on uh, u, or at the same time, it, it occurs uh, turns out that it's uh, just the very same task as minimizing these projection losses. Uh, losses, sorry. Yep. So if we have a point and project it onto U, uh, this uh, raw uh, we are going to lose it, 
And we'd like to minimize all the squared sums of all these uh, uh, rows, yep, so all, of all these distances, what, what we actually lose. So again, with, with squares, we can sum them for all points, and we are going to minimize this. Okay, so this is going to be minimized. It turns out that these uh, uh, tasks are just the same, and they lead to the very same uh, mathematical procedure. It turns out that uh, this can be solved analytically. We, we can do it uh, uh, with some iterative uh, procedure, uh, but uh, it turns out that uh, uh, SVD, singular value decomposition, that I'm going to cover right now, serves ex exactly for this. <clears throat> so uh, singular value decomposition it's some uh, complicated linear algebra operation, but again, uh, just some intuition about it. Uh, singular value decomposition. It tells you that any matrix uh, can be decomposed into factoriza factorization of uh, three other ones. U, sigma, uh, and V. Typically, it's called V, v transpose. Uh, <coughs> in linear algebra, uh, matrix, matrices can uh, geometrically be interpreted as uh, operators. And uh, this tells us that uh, any operator can be decomposed into three operations. Uh, other ones, uh, rotation, uh, stretching, and again, a rotation. If we go to Wikipedia, it's nicely shown there. <coughs> ah, sorry. <coughs> Wikipedia SVD, singular value decomposition. Yeah, well, we'll need to find this one. Okay, so it tells that uh, any uh, oper linear operator uh, can be treated as three operations. So, uh, ah, sorry, it's all jumping. <laughs> okay, I'll turn it off for now. <clears throat> okay, so uh, any any uh, operator can be interpreted as a uh, uh, rotation, then stretching, and then one, one more rotation. Yep. So for instance, if we have an ellipse, uh, if we've got an ellipse like this one, Uh, X might, might represent as some transformation from uh, a unit circle into this ellipse. So we can have a unit circle, and X as a matrix would, uh, would actually uh, define the transformation from uh, any point on this unit circle to this ellipse. So this will be given by X. Okay, much more details are needed to actually understand why this geometric transformation can be given by a met just a matrix. Uh, but uh, singular value decomposition tells us that this transformation is decomposed uh, into a rotation. So this U is a orthogonal matrix, uh, <coughs> uh, which stands for just rotation. This sigma is going to be a diagonal matrix, and it's going to be just stretching. And this V is again orth uh, orthogonal, and it's again a rotation. Okay, and this animation shows us how a unit circle uh, can be uh, converted to an ellipse with just three operations. So it's first rotated, 
So wh where is actually the animation? Yeah, so it's first rotated, then stretched. Yep, so this sigma stands for stretching, and then it's rotated again. Yep, and now one more rotation. And uh, so it's very general, so any uh, metrics in, uh, in linear algebra can be decomposed into three other ones. Okay, so why is it helpful to us? <coughs> so again, x equals u times si some diagonal matrix times v transpose. Uh, what about dimensions here? So this is going to be our data set, L by D. This uh, diagonal matrix uh, is going to be of the very same dimensions, L by D. So it, it will have, it, its structure is as follows. Uh, it contains mostly zeros. But on the main diagonal, there will be uh, some special numbers. So uh, we'll discuss it. This will be called singular values. Sigma 1 and so on till sigma uh, L or D, uh, sigma eta, sigma I, sorry. Okay, this U by U is going to be, sorry, this U matrix will be L by L and uh, it doesn't matter at all for us. So we just f can forget about this U matrix. But this V is going to be uh, D by D. And this one is important. This will, uh, this defines actually the transformation. <coughs> and this, uh, this diagonal matrix uh, sigma will have these uh, small numbers sigmas. And these are going to be responsible to the information uh, uh, which is going to be lost or preserved. Okay, let me uh, describe it with a two-dimensional case. So again, our data cloud. So our uh, two initial axes are here, x1 and uh, x2. So uh, we'll have some L points and D equals to two. D, uh, two dimensions. And uh, we can actually rotate axis. So we can uh, <coughs> just, just change uh, axis in a way that we uh, just make a rotation like this one. And this uh, we called, uh, yeah, we, we called this Z. So let's define it again, Z1. And uh, an orthogonal one will be Z2. And so in these uh, uh, designations, this X matrix is going to be L by two. And it can be decomposed into three others. So we don't care about U. It's going to be a large matrix L by L. This sigma is going to be, again, L by two. And this V is going to be just two by two matrix. This V is going to, uh, to actually define this rotation. So if it's uh, alpha, then this V will be just a rotation matrix cosine, uh, cosine of alpha, uh, here on the main diagonal, again, cosine of alpha. And uh, here we'll have minus sine of alpha and sine of alpha. Okay, so just as a fact, uh, these four numbers define a rotation uh, with angle alpha. So this is V and it, it stands for rotation. And here, uh, in this matrix, sigma will have two important numbers. So this sigma, in our case, is going to be uh, is going to be almost the same as our data. A matrix, a very long matrix, L by two, and it will contain mostly zeros, zero, zero, and all zeros here. But it also contains two numbers sigma 1 and sigma 2. And this will be responsible for uh, the percentage of uh, variance in our data, which, uh, which is explained uh, by direction Z1 and Z2. 
So if we calculate variance uh, in this direction, Z1, it will be proposed proportional to this number sigma 1 squared. And if we calculate variance in orthogonal dimension, it will be proportional to sigma 2 squared. So there's really very, very much math behind that. But closer to practice, uh, we don't care about u. Sigma will tell us uh, how much information in our data set can be projected onto uh, dimension Z1 or Z2. And V defines this, uh, in a sense, optimal uh, transformation, in our case, just a rotation. Let's just generalize it a bit from, from 2D, let's go to 3D. So we can have a three-dimensional data set. X1, X2, X3. And uh, imagine that uh, all these points are, somewhat, are distributed close to some plane. So I can draw a plane. Maybe it's either, even easier to imagine it uh, in real life. So we are in a room. So suppose some plane, maybe from one circle to, from one corner, sorry, to another one. And all points are actually distributed very, very close to this plane. So maybe we don't need two features in this, uh, sorry, three features in this data set. Maybe we can only come up uh, with two features and we'll, we'll won't lose too much information. So here we can define two vectors, u and v. So they're going to lay in this plane. And uh, the third one, let's call again it now w. Uh, so uh, SVD will again define this transformation, uh, again, rotation of our axis to new ones, U, V, and W. So we'll have X, which is our data set. It's going to be L by three. It can be decomposed into U, which is L by L, and we don't care about. Uh, sigma is going to be the same L by three, and V is going to be a three by three metrics. So V again defines this transformation from original axis uh, X to U, V, and W. And uh, here in Lambda, we, we have, uh, sorry, in, in Sigma, here we have these three, three Sigma one, Sigma two, and Sigma three. They, they will tell us how much variance is kept if we project on U or V or W. So this is SVD. And now comes actually dimensionality reduction. It will be truncated SVD. And it's very simple. It's just doing SVD and uh, throwing away some information. So trunca truncated SVD is based on this decomposition, but we'll keep only, in, in our case, only two uh, dimensions. Uh, that will, will mean that we will get X reduced uh, now we'll go from 3D to 2D. So this X, X reduced will be L by 2. And is it, uh, this is as simple as just keeping two, two vectors from here from W. So, uh, sorry, from, from v, this V matrix. So uh, in this geometric interpretation, we just throw away this W. What it means? We don't care about uh, this uh, rightmost V vector, and we will keep uh, only uh, two columns from this sigma matrix. So uh, what about dimensions? U will stay the same. It's uh, L by L. Uh, sigma of will be L by two. So we keep only two uh, left uh, columns in this sigma. And uh, this V, uh, okay, this sigma prime and V prime, and V prime is going to be two by two. And these primes we get from original matrices uh, only selecting necessary columns. So uh, this sigma, uh, okay, I'll draw it here. 
the original sigma was L by 3. Uh, so with, we had three columns, just throw away one of them, and we, we are left with two columns. And the same for V. Only that in, uh, for singular value decomposition, it's more convenient to, to call it here, uh, to put transpose here. So it, it doesn't matter yeah, if it's a quadratic matrix, either it's uh, original or it's transposed. transposed. Uh, if we transpose it, then we, we can uh, say that uh, our new projection is going to be uh, our new data set Z is going to be just by X multiplied by W. In these uh, notations, it will be easier to put here transpose. Okay, so we'll get uh, sigma prime just throwing away one of the columns. S we'll get v prime just throwing away one of the rows. So this v was three by three. And we'll uh, throw away everything connected to w. S just throw it away. Uh, yep, and the column, right. And so thus we get truncated SVD. And uh, yeah, so I really encourage you, if you are interested how this is all done, you, you really need to dive into linear algebra. It's not one hour, it's not two hours. Yes, yeah, I would say it's indeed challenging. Uh, but I think this uh, visualization helps you very much. Yep. So just keep all the information uh, in this U direction, in this V direction. And if we throw away W, this will, uh, will be based on this SVD just by keeping some of the data. How does this work? Yeah, so the question was how it actually works. So I'll show some practical examples. And now just to generalize it a bit more. So suppose you've got D dimensions. We can't visualize it now. So we've got x1, x, blah, 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 xd minus 1, and x, xd. And so suppose your data is distributed uh, under uh, uh, near some subspace of this original space. So maybe we've got some k dimensional space. And what if our data can be nicely projected to this key uh, dimensional, k, k dimensional subspace? So this will be uh, the, the idea of principal component analysis. Uh, so we can lose uh, many dimensions without actually losing too much of information. One of our motivating examples is uh, images. So I'll show you an example with image classification. Uh, Again, neural networks are, is the best approach here, but I'll cover just some basics. But uh, a very nice application of PCA will be uh, images because they are very, very high dimensional. And it turns out that we can reduce dimensions very effectively. So uh, the simplest way to get some features from an image is uh, the following one. So uh, an image is just a matrix. The computer sees an image as uh, uh, if it's let's, uh, the simplest case, a uh, grayscale image. Then there is a mapping between uh, all matrices uh, to images. So these are going to be pixels. And uh, in each pixel, we'll have some number from 0 to 255. Uh, and this uh, 255 will uh, depict uh, white, and these uh, zeros will depict, uh, uh, yep, th this will depict black. And uh, something in the middle will be different shades of gray. Yep, 17 maybe, or 1, 2, 2 are going to be some, somewhat in between. Yep, all the gray colors. So uh, <coughs> really very, very boring how computer sees the world. Uh, the only difference with uh, uh, colored images is, is that we'll have three matrices just like this one. Only that uh, we'll have a special matrix for red colors, special for greens, and special for uh, blues. Uh, and it will be a bit more complicated. Uh, so this will be a tensor, so an, 
uh, a three-dimensional array and uh, it will have three matrices like these standing side by side but we'll uh, focus on grayscale images so the simplest way to get features from it is just to to make a long long vector so let's designate it by d uh, not very nice uh, n so an image is going to be n by n again for simplicity let it be squared and we just create an a very very long vector keep the first row here all the pixels in the first row place them here then the second row and so on and so on and so uh, we'll have an a vector of length n squared this is really a simplest way to get features from an image it turns out that we don't need all of the, these n squared uh, numbers because uh, you know if you if we take a real image like uh, 12 megapixels, maybe it's uh, 3K pixels here and 4K pixels here, then these vectors are going to be re really very, very long, 12, 12 million digits. Turns out that we don't need all of them. We can efficiently uh, redu reduce dimensions, keeping only these principal components, uh, and we actually don't lose too much information. Okay, so some... <coughs> Examples of principal component analysis. <coughs> In a nutshell, what I told about, uh, the, the algorithm is going to be the, the following. So uh, we have, uh, okay, here it was d designated as n, uh, the uh, initial dimensions, and we are going to define some k uh, to actually reduce dimensions. So k is going to be lower than n, so preferably it's going to be much, much sl slower than, uh, than n. <coughs> I'll change it on the go. I defined it as d, the, uh, the number of initial dimensions. Then we'll scale x. Uh, so we're going to shift its uh, centroid in the origin. Uh, so it's just what in scalar and what standard scalar is doing. It's not actually necessary to norm variance here but uh, for simplicity it's uh, typically done so just using standard scalar uh, we change origin uh, change the center of our data cloud to be in the origin then we do singular value decomposition and it's a very very well known operation uh, it's purely linear algebra but the implementations are as old as from the middle of the 18th century so starting from Fortran, Blas, Lapak, all these libraries. Okay, they are very, very efficient. And then we take k leftmost uh, columns of v. Uh, so we uh, decrease dimensions and we got our new matrix z, which is going to be x multiplied by this v. Okay, an example, finally. <coughs> in sklearn, PCA lives here in sklearn decomposition. So the first application will be just visualizing data. Even with uh, the Iris data set, we've got four dimensions and we can't visualize it. <coughs> with PCA, we can find two principal components and uh, project our data to these components. So then we'll visualize our data uh, on, on a 2D space. So we define PCA and we fit our data just as simple as this. Then we'll take two main components here, two principal components, and uh, we'll get a picture like this. <coughs> Sorry, it's not Iris uh, for now, it's uh, just an exam uh, the very same that I, that I was showing. If we've got a two-dimensional data set, we can rotate uh, our axis, and this will go into be principal components. So the first one, We'll, we'll take the most information from our data set, the most variance. And the second one will be, uh, in some sense, redundant. Yep. So it's ver not very much uh, variance in this direction. And we'll lose it if we project our data on, on a new 1D axis, on, uh, just, just axis. Yep. So, so if we want to reduce dimensions from 2D to 1D, then we project onto this first principal component and you see we don't lose too much information. Okay, maybe in such projection uh, some points uh, will, will have 
the very same new value uh, but you know it's not too much uh, sorry I think it's some Russian left <laughs> okay I'll fix that uh, and uh, to know how much exactly we we kept if we reduce dimensions we can uh, call uh, explained variance ratio uh, from from this PCA so you see we, we had X uh, which was uh, 300 by by 2 we actually this is uh, rotating uh, our axis so we we fit it to PCA object and then we we see that uh, first principal component gets 94 percent of variance of the initial data set and the, the other one is only gets only six six percent of ver uh, variance in the original data set if we think about it we can call it uh, Infor uh, information uh, contained in the initial data set. So it's nothing connected to information theory here, but somewhat, if we see variance in our uh, initial data, it's some somewhat connected with information that we actually have in, in our data set. Mm. Okay, and then we can build these uh, V metrics. So it's going to be four numbers uh, defining this rotation. Now visualizing uh, Iris dataset, so we, we load Iris, and uh, uh, these are 150 flowers, so 150 instances, and they have four features. Uh, and Iris has sepal and a petal, and a sepal length, sepal width, and the same for petal uh, width and length. Okay, four features, and we can't visualize the dataset in four dimensions. Uh, so we we tell PCA that we are going to keep only two components and components equals two. Then we fit it to our data and uh, fitting and tr transforming can be done with a single operation. So fit transform will, uh, will actually fit PCA and, and transform our data X and return this X reduced. Th this X reduced is going to be a, uh, a matrix with uh, 150 rows and only two columns, only two principal components. Now we can draw this fine, uh, nice picture. Uh, so this is our data set. If it's projected onto, uh, onto some, some two-dimensional plane. These axes are not interpreted. So just the first component and the second component. We can actually print them. So the first component is some linear combination of in initial features. And another component is also a linear combination of uh, initial features. So for you to, to understand, principal component analysis builds a linear transformation of initial features. It's uh, also one of its limitations. So if you're going to apply it to some data where you've got interpretable features like uh, salary, number of children, uh, I don't know, some score in, in a survey, you're not, maybe you're not going to apply PCA here because it's going to build a linear combination of these features. Some number multiplied by age plus some number multiplied by salary, maybe you're not going to, to build such feature because it's not really interpretable. Okay, but still it's a nice picture. It's uh, some visualization of the Iris dataset. Uh, we can take a look how much information uh, we've got if we project data onto these two components. Okay, I didn't do it here, but it's uh, something more than uh, 90%. And it somewhat, somehow it shows us the, the picture. It says that one of the classes is uh, linearly separable so it's really very easy to distinguish one of these species. Yep, so the original task is uh, three class classification, so uh, three types of irises. And we see that uh, it's, uh, it's an easy task. Yeah? So we can distinguish one of these species very easily. And uh, others are they just a bit mixing here, intermingling. But still, it's, we see that it's, it delivers some intuition about the data set. The same for handwritten digits. So uh, I just briefly discussed uh, how we can interpret uh, digits, how we can get features from there. 
uh, in SQLearn it's a simplified version. We've got uh, uh, handwritten digits, uh, eight by eight. So they are really of low resolution. And uh, if you uh, extract features, uh, from there, you'll get 64 dimensional vectors. Yep. So 8 by 8 becomes a 64 dimensional vector. But we can uh, find two principal components here and project our data. And you see, this visualization is uh, not, I would say, it's not useless. Yeah? It delivers some intuition about the data set. So just think about it it's a projection from 64 dimensions onto a, a, a plane. This can be done with, well, there are really very, very uh, ways, very, a lot of ways to do this transformation. So there are combinatorically uh, many ways to do a projection from 64 dimensions to a plane. No, sorry, even not combinatorically many, infinite number of ways to project. But still we can find a, a nice plane. So if we project data to uh, this nice plane, we don't lose too much information. And it somehow shows us that uh, zeros are gathered in some region of space. Uh, maybe f fours are also in another region of space. Uh, it tells us that eights uh, are intermingling with uh, other digits. So it uh, delivers some intuition about the data set. At least that uh, you, you can easily distinguish uh, zeros from all other handwritten digits. And we can actually visualize these two principal components. So uh, principal components are going to be linear combinations of initial features. So these are also going to be vectors of size 64. And we can uh, actually get uh, images from this vector. So if we reshape it back to 8 by 8, we'll get an image. So this tells us that we can visualize these principal components. And uh, if you do so, you see that uh, maybe this one looks like a, like a handwritten 3, if you look at white. Uh, maybe if you look at black colors, it's going to be something similar to 4. Uh, maybe the second one is more interpretable, so it's somewhat, uh, in a sense, it's, it's a new feature. So PCA created a new feature in our data set, and this second principal component is definitely somewhat connected to brightness in the middle and dark regions uh, on edges. And we'll see nice examples with uh, faces. PCA can serve as for data compression. So in some sense, we, we do these when training algorithm and uh, making dim dimensionality reduction. So it's uh, closely connected to dimensionality reduction. So uh, this is one of the source images. So a eight by eight uh, picture, and this is handwritten five. And if we do principal component analysis and uh, keep different number of features, this is how uh, the projection of this uh, handwritten five is going to look like. I'll make a short comment on this uh, picture, so maybe you don't uh, get the idea how these projections are, are built. So again, this uh, original 64 dimensional space Okay, so this is the feature space, x1, x, d minus 1, x, uh, d. In our case, d is 64. And somewhere in this space, we've got a point which corresponds to this handwritten 5. Okay, it's a vector of uh, 64 uh, digits, so just, just a point in this uh, original d-dimensional space. And if we do PCA, uh, keeping only one uh, axis, so we are looking for the best direction here to, uh, to actually to project our 
data on. So from 64D, we are projection, projecting just onto a straight line. Well, we are going to lose a lot of information. And uh, if we do this projection, we'll, we'll have some point on this axis. So this will actually be this Z1 first principal component. Yep, but if you think about it, this point is at the same time, it's uh, still a point in this uh, original uh, feature space. Uh, so again, we'll, we can take these 64 uh, components and uh, build a picture. So if this was point A, then this projection is A prime. Uh, we can focus only on this Z axis and then we'll, we'll have just one number. But at the same time, uh, this Z axis still lives in this original feature space. And we can take a look at these, all these 64 numbers uh, corresponding to A prime. Yep. So this is going to be X1 prime, X D prime. Okay, so again, we can find a 64 dimensional vector corresponding to this point. And so we can reshape it back to eight by eight picture. And this is going to be some projection for this uh, handwritten five. And again, the very same picture if we take a look at more dimensions. So this again is a 60, 64 dimensional space. Now we'll find a 2D subspace and uh, this handwritten five will be projected onto this 2D space, but still we can draw actually this, this point corresponding to the projection. And that's uh, what is going to appear. So if we project only on the first component, so well, we lose too much information. You know, we don't, maybe we even don't recognize 105 here. But if we increase the number of dimensions, this projection is looking more and more similar to the original 105. And so we can do it up to 64. So this is the original image. Now maybe the crucial question, how many components to choose? And so typically there is just a tradition that you by default keep 90% of the variance in your data set. Just a constant like uh, p-value is 5%, just everybody agreed that it's 5%. Uh, so here by the same token, uh, you just keep 90% of variance in your data set. And so when we build this uh, singular value decomposition, I told you that uh, uh, we had this metric sigma. So this is responsible, uh, sorry, uh, this is responsible for this uh, percentage of information that we get. So we had this uh, decomposition and this sigma looked like uh, this. So almost all are zeros, but here we had sigma one, sigma two, and so on, up to sigma d. And so actually squares of these numbers sum up to one, sigma one squared plus sigma two squared, and so on, plus sigma d squared. This is going to be one. And these, uh, these sigmas stands, uh, stand for this explained variance. Uh, in, uh, so if we keep only one uh, dimension, then this will, will stand for the percentage of uh, data uh, retained. So this might be something like 0.7. So 70% of, of all uh, the information in our data set can be retained if we project it onto 1D. If we keep two dimensions, so maybe we'll have some more. So this sigma two squared might be something like 0.15. And so altogether, this will explain 85% of our data set and so on and so on. Other components are less and less important. And so we'll just put a threshold, keeping, uh, keeping so many components that this sums up to 0.9 to retain 90% of uh, the initial variance. 
So in, in this learn it's implemented in this explained variance ratio. So it's going to be just a vector of, and uh, we can build such a plot. So uh, x-axis is the number of principal components that we uh, find in our data set. So it's, it's less than 64. So 64 is our original dimensions. And uh, if we plot the running sum of these uh, sigmas, this will be explained variance ratio. So you see, if we keep 10 principal components in our data set, uh, this will explain about 70% of variance of the initial data set. And so just typically you put a threshold here on 90% uh, and it, it will say, say that uh, you need 21 component to, to keep 90% of variance of the initial data set. Okay, so this is so popular that you can even pass it as an, uh, in a constructor as an argument, the very same end components. If you just uh, put a float here, 0.9, this will keep, uh, this will actually build truncated uh, SVD with 21 component. <laughs> Sorry, I'll fix that. Uh, okay, so now uh, the most interesting part, how it can be applied to images. So we'll use uh, sklearn uh, faces dataset. Well, it, it was not created by sklearn, but sklearn has a nice way to, to import this data set. Uh, so we'll now have uh, pictures uh, 50 by 37. Uh, so if we extract very simple features, this will be 1850 dimensional features. And uh, we've got uh, 15, 1560 instances in our data set. This is a 12 class classification problem. So these are some real persons, pretty famous. Uh, George Bush, Ariel Sharon, uh, uh, Serena Williams, Tony Blair. Okay, it will be nice to visualize it. So here are some samples from the data, data set. So you can recognize some of them. So we are going to do 12 class classification here. And uh, the distribution of targets in our data set is the following. So, okay, mostly it's George Bush, then uh, Colin Powell, and so on. Okay, and just uh, one more illustration. So our picture is again going to be a matrix, but now its dimensions are 50 by 37. It's a resolution of the picture. And again, we we convert it in an interlong vector of size 50 by 37 equals 1850. If you think about it, this is a really very bad transformation. So we lose everything about uh, loca locality. So uh, in our original image, uh, we can think of some region, you know, this upper right region. And we, we've got some pixels here. And uh, of course, we, we understand this, that some, some of two pixels are, are very close to each other. Okay, so these are close and we, we have some idea of uh, locality. We can extract some regions, but you know here we, with this trans transformation, we just lose all this information. Okay, I'll depict it nicer. Uh, so we have two adjacent uh, pixels that, that, can, can be, that can be converted into separate features. Yep, so this is our image. So just some part of it, some pixels here. And you see we can have two pixels that are really close by. And with this transformation, one of them is going to be just one feature and another one is going to be just another feature. You see, we lose very much information, a lot of information here. This, this is handled by convolutional neural networks, which are able to work with these uh, local regions of the original photo, but it's out, out of scope for now. Uh, so we are creating the simplest possible features from images. It, it turns out that we don't need all of these dimensions. So let's apply principal component analysis here. 
Uh, so first we did train test split to do classification further. So if you do uh, <coughs> principal component analysis, uh, there is some more efficient way of it uh, to, to do it not in exact way, but in randomized. Okay, these are just details to, to do it more efficiently. It turns out that we can uh, extract 100 components and it will explain more than 90% of variance. So almost 93% of variance is retained if we just keep 100 principal components. So you see, it's a, now it's a very nice dimensionality reduction from 1850 to just 100 of dimensions. Well, so now some nice pictures. We can visualize these principal components. Yep, so all of these components are linear combinations of initial features. So let's just resize it back to 50 by 37 and, and we can draw it. And you see, these are... Okay, what's the intuition be behind these nice pictures? Is that uh, there is m much variance in our data set uh, in, the, in the corresponding dimensions. Yep, so you see, uh, this first, first principal component is a face that is dark in the inner part and bright outside. The third one is uh, almost the same. Uh, the second one, you see, it's uh, bright on one side and dark on the other side. So we can treat it as some features in our data set. So as if principal component analysis created some new features. Well, the intuition why uh, on one of the pictures you see, maybe this one, principal component, this highlights nose. Yep. The idea is that, uh, okay, noses are different. So uh, there is maybe some sort of a direction in this feature space which, is, which corresponds to a nose. And so there is some variation al along this direction because noses are different. So obviously then pixels are different and it all leads to the variation in this direction. And so uh, if we keep this component, then we'll retain this information. And it, it looks really very, very similar to how uh, neural net describes uh, intermediate uh, features. So if you visualize what's going on in the layers inside a convolutional neural net, it's going to be some, something really very similar to what we see here. Only that uh, this is a linear transformation. So PCA only builds linear uh, combinations of initial features and neural net will do nonlinear transformations. Uh, therefore, more capacity. Okay, we can even just for fun build a mean phase. If you calculate mean of all these uh, principal components, you'll, you'll have something similar. To, to this. Okay, definitely George Bush dominates here. Um, okay, and now we've uh, reduced dimensions and we can now classify faster, you see? So we'll build just a multinomial logistic regression, which is a softmax classifier, uh, but we'll, we'll perform a principal component analysis. Yep, so we'll have a reduced data set uh, with only 100 features. And now our, our algorithm is going to, to be trained uh, much faster. And so here we, we can do it with accuracy as high as 72%. And we can, uh, just to get some intuition, we can build a confusion matrix to see uh, which classes are confused. Uh, so maybe the true person is uh, this guy. Okay, I don't know him. I'm not going to spell <laughs> spell this. Okay, so we can find some uh, some interesting confusions uh, to get some intuition uh, why these or that classes are confused. Uh, but you see here the algorithm uh, is performing really nicely, and we we trained it uh, in in several seconds, in in 20 seconds. Okay, yeah, what is lacking here uh, is the comparison. What if we trained the same algorithm with uh, the initial data set with uh, 1850 features? How it will uh, be compared in terms of accuracy? Okay, I'll add this part here as well. 
But it turns out that uh, with original features, it's going to be, it's going to, to, to train much longer. You see, uh, 1850 features instead of just 100. So it's going to be trained order, order of magnitude longer than in our case. And we'll see that accuracy is almost the same, maybe just a bit better. Okay, let's make a small break and then clustering.